Hi, Todd and Monty. Thanks for talking to me today about trends in CPG automation. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. So today we're chatting about results from studies from both of your organizations. Mani, we're examining results from CRB's Horizons Digital Age of Food Manufacturing Report. And Todd, we're looking at results of the Rockwell Automation State of Manufacturing CPG Edition Report. And both studies talk about external obstacles that CPG companies face. And the CRB report dives deep into the food and beverage industry. So Todd, to start, can you share your thoughts on why the industry's challenge of supply chain disruptions has decreased in importance, it seems, while workforce challenges have increased? Yes. Yeah, so in our report, this was related to the question about external obstacles to CPG, as you say, and, and what they were facing. And in 2024, supply chain, which was previously listed in 2023 as the second biggest challenge actually dropped to fifth place. Um, and, and I think this is just a reflection of uh, the, you know, the overall global supply chain uh, concern finally correcting itself. I think many of us saw that in 2024. We as a manufacturer, I know, saw that in our volumes, our lead times normalizing back to what were essentially pre-pandemic levels. Uh, with our CPG clients, we're still seeing some lingering effects uh, from that. And there's still a few challenges around raw material sourcing uh, caused by, you know, geopolitical issues or certain, you know, uh, unstableness in, in certain parts of the world. Uh, so it's still ranked in the top five, but I think most would agree that, you know, there was significant improvement in the in the past 12 months. We've certainly seen that. It's not quite the, top, the, the primary topic of conversation in every dialogue that we have anymore. Uh, meanwhile, inflation, inflation and cost pressures have, have risen up in the pecking order as well as workforce challenges. Um, you know, these have really taken over the, the uh, topic of conversation in nearly every one of our customer executive briefings, things like the high cost of money, what's happening with the interest rates, it's instability of an election year, all those things weigh in uh, to the conversation and probably, you know, still very consistently workforce challenge tougher to find people in a in a shrinking labor market, at least for manufacturing jobs. Yeah, and that's what we hear all the time is the finding the skilled workers. So when companies are addressing that, um, they're face, they're dealing with worker retention, attracting employees and onboarding them. Can you summarize for us the challenges and how they're um, why they're affecting the industry so much and what some of the respondents are doing about that? Sure. So I'll start with the attracting piece. That's typically the first step. And it's a, you know, it's actually a bit of a paradox because the broader job market itself has, has really been tough in terms of, you know, I, I have a college uh, graduate daughter and her and her peers are, you know, seeking work in a very you know tough market. But the, the reality is in manufacturing, there are plenty of, of roles to be found for those who are willing and interested in, in taking on those types of jobs. But what our clients keep telling us in CPG is frustration with not being able to find or effectively attract these types of resources. Uh, you know, I've had engineering or manufacturing vice presidents tell us stories about, you know, posting job requisitions and receiving zero applications, zero resumes. And we, we had another uh, vice president of a very large food and beverage company say that they believe as a company culture that they will never go back to 2019 pre-pandemic work, you know, plant floor workforce model. They just think it's irreversible. It's really, you know, changed into a new normal. Um, and we hear that, you know, the, the the statistics and the feedback on on plant jobs, let's say, are less attractive with earlier career generations in in the workforce. For whatever reason, they're perceived to be dirty or messy environments. And and of course, we know certain uh, CPG sub segments are worse than others in that regard. And so our clients are consistently asking us for help with the uh, attraction part of the obstacle. One thing we're doing about it, you asked, Teresa, is, you know, and it's been a unique program, a partnership that we, we've we several years into now called uh, the Academy of Advanced Manufacturing. And this is a partnership program in which we have focused on training and certifying veterans of our U.S. military service branches 
and training them up on automation and controls and electrical disciplines in order to broaden the pool of labor. It's a little bit thinking outside of the box. Uh, and then once we've certified them, it's a 12 week program, we match them with employers in the manufacturing space. And feedback on that has, of course, been tremendous. It's a win, win, win for, for all parties. And, and we're working to even scale that further. And that's you know been one way of addressing it. If we move to the onboarding and retention piece, that's where clients are working to improve the time to value as they bring on new associates, operators, uh, maintenance technicians. And they're trying to capture, you know, tribal knowledge of, from the longtime experienced operators and maintenance and personnel who are retiring or leaving the company uh, at an increasingly, you know, uh, growing rate uh, of, of, of exiting the workforce. And the reality is that, you know, the timelines have just become much more compressed. Um, we were just with a beverage producer at our headquarters th earlier this week, um, and they shared that sometimes they have new associates who are being trained by mentors that are really only a few months ahead of them. Like may, they maybe just were onboarded, you know, earlier this year and they're training brand new people. Previously, that would have been done by someone with many years, decades possibly of experience. So that timeline is, is getting much more compressed in what they're having to, you know, deal with. And then, you know, finally, all of these things combined, of course, is leading to higher attrition rates. You know, if they, they get them trained up, uh, they have shorter retention time as these newly trained resources can easily jump at new opportunities for just a, a you know a, a few dollars more in pay in this very tight labor market. And I think they're recognizing that's you know unfortunately the new normal. To uh, add add to that, um, our Horizon report showed similar findings on the labor shortages. Our clients are very concerned about that today. Um, Twenty four percent of respondents actually thought it might get worse uh, yeah. in the next three years, which is. Oh boy. Uh, 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 not uh, not uh, inspiring, but uh, we can use things like uh, digitalization, using in, uh, guided work instructions to help support onboarding and and training of new uh, new team members, and then upskilling throughout those uh, uh, new technologies that we can deploy to the manufacturing floor. Couldn't agree more. And again, it's it, that's starting to become the very you know uh, primary conversation we have these in executive briefings of like. We got to think outside the box. We got to start thinking of doing things different way to be a more attractive uh, destination for labor. That's a good point. Um, companies are starting to use automation more to either augment um, the, the human labor that they have or to um, just in general in increase efficiency, find new ways of doing things. There's so much discussion of AI, machine learning. Um, do did Todd, did your survey show any um, increase in that and what kind of automation they're using? Yeah, all of those things you mentioned, I think, you know, the thing that keeps coming up as kind of top of mind when they say, well, why we, why should we use these newer technologies? It, should, it never should really be an argument for technology for technology's sake. We always argue that like you should be trying to solve a business outcome. And to your point, Teresa, it always tends to start with uh, production, right? That's at the end of the day, all these uh, clients basically are charged with getting product out the door and right that that sort of supersedes every other conversation. If it's not helping do that, it's a non-starter. And so nearly all of our you know CPG clients have acknowledged that, okay, these obstacles and headwinds, just like Monty said, they're not going away. In fact, they're they're going to get worse in many cases. And the new normal is uh, we we say do more with less, right? You, you know, despite all of those things, you still got to get the product. There's no excuse for kind of like not meeting production demand, and so they they basically are saying can't keep doing things the same way, can't you know keep expecting same outcomes with same practices, and so we're starting to see you know very encouragingly more investment in those types of technologies, much more exploration. In our smart manufacturing report, in fact, you know over the past year we saw. Uh, a 26% year-over-year increase in these digital or smart uh, investments. Previous year, 2023, that number was 21. So, you know, up up from 21 to, to, to 26. We're still a little behind the overall manufacturing average of 30%, but at least, you know, for CPG, it's, it's trending in the right direction. On a similar note, our report also showed that 86% 
are at least evaluating it. They may not be acting on it and investing, you know, financially yet, but they're evaluating it. They're looking into it. Uh, they're they're looking for those use cases that will change the game. The one that benefits anything to do with production optimization, things like equipment efficiency, yield, uh, quality improvement, uh, reducing scrap and waste. You know, anything that goes to that more with less theme. Um, Another key benefit, I think, of these technologies, and you alluded to it earlier, Teresa, is that that workforce topic of, you know, we continue to hear that those who are the, the CPG producers that are kind of considered ahead of the curve or leading this, um, they're, they are making more attractive employers, right? They, uh, not surprisingly, you know, workers want to be exposed to cool and cutting edge technologies, all things equal, they're going to choose the the employer that's doing a little bit more uh, leading edge types of things. They want to. They want to be engaged. They want to, you know, see cause and effect of of digital technology being realized in in real time. Um, you know, we all know that engaged workers stick around longer, um, and so I think many of our clients are are coming around to the idea of you know competing in a tough labor market requires you to stand out. A, you know, a little bit as as a more exciting destination. That's uh, interesting, Todd. Um... I was talking to a client uh, just recently and uh, um, specifically talking with an, an HR professional and they were talking and use, about using technology not also a, as a recruiting tool and as a retention tool um, like you highlighted in your uh, in your report. Yeah, absolutely. So as you know, you're talking about efficiencies, CPG manufacturers are using data for continuous improvement, but according to your report, um, Todd, the smart, the state of smart manufacturing report, only 40% of respondents say their data is being used effectively. So do you think AI can supplement data collection and improve how it's used? Yeah, that, that was a compelling statistic that stood out in the report. It wasn't surprising, but I think it was, it was notable because it's, it's validating a lot of, you know, assumptions that we've made in these conversations. And I think it's a key point that, you know, the proliferation of industrial data in manufacturing over the years has, has exponentially increased like it has in most, you know, uh, uh, parts of the um, uh, the economy is that, you know, as, as systems and assets become smarter and more collected. Um, what we found, actually, we heard this term this week was like our clients are saying that they're rich in data, but poor in actionable information, right? They they have more than ever to make decisions, but less idea about which decision to make. Um, and so we spent a lot of time in the customer conversations kind of diving into that. Um, which data is valuable? Not all data are created equal. Uh, we talk a lot about contextualization, the, the phrase that was used by one of our uh, customers, uh, which I like to repeat is getting the right information to the right person at the right time to make the right decision. And they want to do it in real time. Uh, very few want to know about how we did last week or the week before. You know, um, I had a, a plant manager joke with me. I guess he wasn't joking so much, but he in a meeting he said, "I don't need another you sucked yesterday report. I got plenty of those. Right? I need to know what's going to happen right now, or better yet, you know, before it happens." Um, and AI, I think, has really you know been able to supplement. It's good. It's good at that in a number of ways. You know, in order to streamline the collect collection piece, um, it gets into that. You know, which are the data pieces, and how can we tie them to other sources and the information to put together a little bit more of a puzzle? It has to be done typically at high volume. You know, AI, of course, is very good at analyzing things at high volume that we couldn't do do otherwise. And then we we're able to use things like soft sensors or predictable inferences where we infer something through AI based on variables that cannot be measured directly. That's important in a lot of, you know, different, uh, especially legacy type of assets that may not be as smart or able to report directly. And then that contextualization piece, as I said, it, it typically depends on very high volumes of production or process data so that we can uh, identify pattern recognition, right? We're doing that a lot in process of like, we did it right. And we call it like a golden batch, for example, we did it right in this particular shift on this day, but we haven't been able to replicate it since. What was it? What were the combination of parameters that tied together to make that happen and make it so? And so that ability to seek out anomalies and and iteratively learn as we go that, you know, high compute power that can be done, leverage things through like the cloud, 
to model and, and improve each time. And so I think AI is good at executing and streamlining that type of analysis. Uh, and then in turn, when it learns, it can recommend and make adjustments to things like workflow or code or models. Um, in fact, on code, another way uh, that, that we have now, like for AI to streamline that efficiency is the generation or interpretation of control code. You know, we hear that back to the workforce thing, younger generation, they don't like ladder logic, right? They think that's old and antiquated and there's got to be a better way. And so things like, you know, embedded is like, you know, uh, GPT copilot to do code generation or even interpretation, understanding of code. And that, you know, of course, that has some workforce benefits as, as well. Yeah, there's a lot of potential there. And um, you mentioned earlier, I think the statistic was about 85% of your respondents are looking into technology and investigating the potential. Yeah. Do you, in general, see that the CPG companies are resistant, generally resistant to change, or are they opening up more? What's your feel for that? Yeah, definitely opening up. You know, C CPG has historically been a little on the conservative side and, you know, say maybe some of our other industry counterparts like life sciences or semiconductor, maybe, maybe I'd say like higher margin types of markets. But, you know, I think the necessity of, you know, those challenges we talked about earlier and the headwinds that they're facing are, you know, changing maybe their mindset to more of that survival of the fittest mentality. I can't be left behind, right? And so we're definitely seeing much more exploration into those uh, I'll call them state of the possible questions, right? That they want to explore of like, hey, what are other folks in my segment? What are other producers like me doing? Can I replicate that? Can I, uh, you know, ca uh, catch up or or be a good, better, best? What is those? What do those look like in different work streams? And so um, the other change I would say that's really changed in, in especially in the last year or two is it's now uh, cross functional, right? That 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 conversation which traditionally would have been with our usual suspects in at least for us in the engineering world is now spanning you know IT and supply chain and operations and it's at executive levels to break down those silos and kind of get things done you know holistically and so that's critical and then of course that's that's been very encouraging to see that is exciting and um, specifically, you know, I'd like to take a slight turn here and talk to you, Monty, about the food and beverage industry. And I know that you, there was a deep dive into your Horizons report. Can you talk about some of the key takeaways that came out of that report? So um, I always love working on our Horizon reports. And uh, this latest re Horizon report was focused on digitalization and the food and beverage industries. And um, uh, yeah, it gave us the opportunity to survey uh, our industry partners in our industry and gather data, seek to understand that data. And it's always a really a treat to, to dig in and dive deep. Um, we uncovered five kind of key themes uh, through the survey data. And uh, the first one was really a journey to digital maturity that our um, food and beverage clients are on. And really it is a journey. Um, there is really, uh, it, you basically have to take a first step and engage into this digital um, digital manufacturing uh, industry 4.0 gain, and really uh, not sure always what the uh, what the end is because uh, the technology continues to change as we use it. And in doing that, we continue to set our goals a little bit further and a little bit further. So that maturity uh, aspect is a journey. Um, one thing that we did find interesting is that 71% of our survey respondents uh, aim to reach to the highest level of digital maturity in the next three years. That's uh, that's a pretty impressive number. Uh, that's an aggressive number. Mm -hmm. And so um, we are seeing a, a pretty big gap from uh, where they are today and where they desire to be. So um, we're seeing that as a, a healthy tension actually in the uh, in their organizations and in the industry as a whole. Uh, the second theme we uncovered was uh, this idea of uh, streamlining operations through productivity. Um, and they really, uh, our clients are seeing this as a outcome of their digital uh, manufacturing journey. Uh, and it's also a key driver in their future investments. 70% um, of our respondents ranked productivity as the most attractive advantage resulting from digital manufacturing transformation. So as they're on this journey, they're really seeking to increase their productivity, their throughput, um, 
one of the drivers for that desire to increase productivity really comes from our, uh, our third uh, observation, which is this labor shortage and the labor challenge, which uh, Todd addressed earlier. Um, it is definitely uh, a top five challenge for our, uh, for our industry. And um, uh, it's definitely highlighted in the uh, Rockwell's State of Smart Manufacturing report as the number one internal obstacle. Um, like I highlighted early, earlier, 24% of our respondents say it's, uh, it's going to potentially get worse, not necessarily get better. So uh, as we see a changing demographics in our workforce, as we uh, continue to see uh, population decreases in, uh, in, um, advan in uh, mature, uh, um, mature countries, we see the need to address that through digitalization, advanced manufacturing. The, uh, the fourth um, item that came, came to light or kind of surfaced as we were looking at that data was uh, really the ES&G efforts. Um, and they continue to be a driver in the food and beverage industries and for our customers. 97% um, of food and beverage manufacturers uh, really um, look for digital uh, information to help bridge that gap for their compliance, for their quality, and for their governance uh, aspects. And the fifth, uh, the kind of the fifth theme that surfaced was uh, the idea of limited capital. Um, one of the challenges, and Todd highlighted this earlier, is that in the CPG and specifically in the food and beverage industries, uh, margins are typically tight, um, and uh, capital is not as easily um, allocated to their to their operations. And so, um, really understanding ROI of digital um, systems and solutions. Uh, is a challenge for our customers, and really, um, they're looking to spend their capital as wisely as possible. They know they need to do it. They know there's a gap. Um, they're just trying to figure out which technologies to best leverage to get them the most uh, value for their capital investment. That's really a high-level summary of uh, a, a kind of what the data kind of told us, um, but. Uh, um, would definitely love some uh, feedback from Todd or Patricia. Any insights from uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I'll weigh in on the ESG one. I think because I didn't talk about that earlier, but um, I think it's it, it's very in line with what we hear or are continuing to hear around ESG. I I will say in CPG, uh, for lack of a better description, the talk outs often outs outpaces the action you know there tends to be a little as, as one of our uh, consultants said uh, they like to they like to talk green they just don't like to spend green and so um so the uh the, the typically uh those like we we see those uh, kind of initiatives other than the compliance ones that are required that you mentioned um those often get struck from budgets at the end or they get deferred to a later phases which maybe uh, will will actually come to fruition, and maybe they never will. But uh, we do see a little bit, I would say, a lagging in the CPG segment around those initiatives. Certainly on the uh, limited capital budgets, and I, I, I did highlight that earlier. But uh, it's affecting, I think, timelines. You know, maybe it not isn't necessarily out out uh, right canceling projects, but we do hear because of the the high cost of money in the macroeconomic climate right now that things. Uh, can get pushed out a quarter or two or worse, uh, or scope could be be reduced. It goes back to maybe how you strike things from the budget, which is uh, maybe why the ESG doesn't make it in the first phase because it's not directly production related. And so we, we do see that kind of cause and effect of like, yes, maybe we'll wait to see if things improve. We'll see what the Fed does with rates. We'll see what happens with the election. You know, all those kinds of things are, they come up in literally every conversation. So I think it's... Uh, it's validating to see that in your report as well. So, Mani, let's look at some of these challenges a little bit more closely. What did respondents say were their plans for addressing some of these challenges? Yeah, so uh, like I said, one of the things that was uh, really evident in the report was this uh, gap between where the food and beverage industry and our customers are today and where they desire to be uh, with uh, this idea of, how do we move our organizations from uh, paper-based or manual production 
to automated ma automated production to uh, truly lights out types of uh, manufacturing where um, where processes run uh, unattended and and uh, the equipment and machinery is uh, actively monitored through uh, through sensors and devices and uh, disruption is uh, identified and uh, maintenance technicians are called when needed. So, um, you know, that's kind of the future. How do we get from where we are today to that future? And uh, one of those, uh, one of the uh, concepts that I think came out through the report is this idea of uh, leveraging you know, different industry 4.0 technologies, um, different things like uh, automation, AI, um, intelligent sensors, big data, data analytics. All of these are tools in our tool bag that we have to start to answer some of these questions of how do we get uh, more, uh, more productivity from our existing facilities um, and how do we uh, get more productivity out of our limited resource pool when it comes to uh, human resources, right? So once again, back to the labor crunch, how do we get more productivity, more uh, produced with the same number of employees or potentially less numbers of employees? That's, uh, that was something that really came out of that uh, digital transformation concepts and uh, um, yeah, we uh, continue to look at uh, different disruptive technologies to help solve these problems. Um, talked about analytics and intelligence, um, the idea of collecting a lot of data. Um, are we using that data to really make informed decisions? Um, I think that's kind of almost the next generation of, uh, uh, or the next step that many of our, uh, our customers are looking to make in the food and beverage industry, and I'm guessing as well in the CPG uh, market as well, mm -hmm. um, taking uh, the the a lot of the data that we're collecting today, transforming it in an intelligent way so that it's actionable. We can make decisions based on it. That it's not just uh, what we did uh, in the past, but also starting to look at what we can do in the future from a production standpoint. Um, one actionable way is to really transition from a reactive maintenance type of programs um, with the sensors we have today. We can detect downtime, we can track downtime, we track OEE, we track all of these things as far as what happened. Um, the next generation of uh, automation will really look at how do we predict that and how do we prevent it from happening in the first place. So. Um, when we see uh, excessive vibration, for example, how do we uh, take action on that prior to a, a machine shutdown? Um, those sensors and those capabilities are available today, and we start we are start we are seeing our customers start to deploy some of those technologies. I was just going to add that's one of the conversations that a number of our uh, customers are are asking us about, especially with regard to new capacity building. That, as you say, kind of next generation. Uh, plant factory of the future, whatever you may call it, moving towards that more autonomous uh, aspiration of, you know, for the for lack of a better phrase, lights out type of approach. And I think that's where we've spent and we value the, you know, the perspective of partnerships like CRB to, to go through that exercise of what would it look like? What is the point of view? Uh, can we do it with, as, as you referenced, Mon Monty, with fewer FTEs because we have to, not necessarily because there's a, a specific cost uh, justification to it, but it's because of that, you know, back to say that new reality, what does it look like? And, and we don't want to, um, you know, shortchange the design for near term and then, you know, put ourselves in a corner for future, you know, 5, 10, 15 years out. So mm -hmm. they're certainly looking for that, you know, industry perspective from our, our collective, you know, teams. Well, these are really good insights. So I'm curious um, from each of you, if you have an opinion about how you're encouraged about the results from your studies and how you want your our listeners to use this information, maybe we'll start with you, Todd. 
Sure. Yeah. The, well, the first encouragement was just in the number of actual respondents. You know, anytime you do a survey like this, you hope you get a good cross section of various industries and and uh, segments of that make up your industry vertical. So that was encouraging. Uh, you know, our food and beverage or CPG clients, they they want their voices to be heard, uh, and they want to see, as I said earlier, about how they compare and stack up against their peers. You know, where are they along the curve? Uh, and then I think second encouragement was in that desire, again, whether it be the investment or the exploration level to, you know, to um, to uh, pursue change and improvement. What 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 we would want our listeners to to do is take that next step of exploration. You know, if you haven't started or wherever you may be along the journey, you know, start that process of self-assessment, either in-house yourself or with support from from uh, partners like either of us to determine you know where along that maturity curve are you and what practical steps big or small you can take to move up the curve you know and, and figure out in our world what does good and better and best and leading and world class look like uh, you know to achieve the right desired business outcomes and you know ultimately that's what I think you know Monty and I would both say our organizations are trying to support is not really you know, going back to that technology for technology's sake is like we're trying to help feed the growing global population, right? That's that's important. We're all in this together. And so if we can help our producers uh, succeed, we feel like, well, we'll probably succeed by by partnership. And Monty, how about you? Yeah, I think um, uh, definitely I'm encouraged by the uh, the the types of responses that we received and just the uh, um, the engagement in the uh, of the industry in in bettering itself as uh, as a whole. Um, obviously, there's still much work to be done, um, and it is a journey. And we describe this digital transformation as a journey purposefully, um, because uh, yeah, it's not uh, it's not a single step, it's not a, a five step process, but it is a a, a long journey, and that's. Uh, and you can get on the, that journey at any point in time. And so um, I'm really encouraged that uh, the food and beverage manufacturers are, are really engaged in this conversation. Uh, uh, I think typically the food and beverage industry is uh, can be a late adopter of technology because uh, uh, what works is uh, usually what we go to. Um, but uh, seeing uh, they're seeing their challenges in the industry and, and we're engaging in that and engaging in these conversations around mm -hmm. digital transformation, uh, really to support their productivity, their operational go goals, their ES and G goals. Um, one of the, the things I was really encouraged in, uh, in the data that we, that we captured was that the capital, uh, albeit very limited, um, is being utilized to implement some of these uh, technology and these technologic these technology advances to really move the food and beverage manufacturing market, and really even in the greater CPG market, we see that uh, that investment dollars are starting to shift more towards technology and implementation of those to drive the larger uh, productivity and, and manufacturing improvements. So uh, that's really. Uh, um, encouraging to me and i think it's encouraging to uh, uh to uh, partners like rockwell and and, and uh, our partnership with crb and then how we continue to deliver projects for our customers yeah well said this has been a very useful conversation at looking what's looking at what's happening and what the potential is for improvement so thank you both for being here today i really appreciate it my pleasure Thanks, Teresa. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. You'll find links to both the reports in this episode's show notes so you can download them and get the in-depth information from them. And please be sure to subscribe to Automation Chat and give us a five-star rating and review. I'm Teresa Hauk with The Journal Magazine, and we'll chat again soon.